23 and verse number 27, Matthew 23, 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying it together this morning. And as we do so, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ. It would be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, this morning we want to uh, use this verse just kind of a starting point. Um, I mentioned to you last week that the week before, I had some dental work done, had a couple of teeth pulled, and um, they're going to put uh, implants in there so they have to fill in the socket where your tooth was uh, and what they fill it in with is dead men's bones. Um, they take cadaver bones, they grind them up and they make you know, the, 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 the hygienist, the nurse, the dentist, dental nurse, whatever she was, told me it's kind of like pouring concrete. You kind of like you know, pour it in there and trowel it off on top and then you put a, a stitch of covering over it so it doesn't. Nadine said amazingly it hasn't slowed down my mouth at all so you know that's 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 good so um, but but so they, they put these dead men's bones is then your own bones around your what was your tooth root your own bone grows right into that dead men's bones and just forms a solid base and then they put a pin in and an implant and all that kind of hoo-ha but um, I, I, the whole time, you know, when they told me what they do with this, they put these cadaver bones, and they don't call them dead men's bones, they call them cadaver bones, which sounds so much nicer, you know, like the guy, the, the dentist, I don't know, they were putting something around my head or something, and, and he said, your, your head has a large circumference. <laughs> And I said, well, that sounds much better than fat head. So uh, anyhow, it's very, very clinical. Your head has a large circumference. So um, anyhow, they, they, they do say cadaver bones instead of, instead of dead men's bones. But the point is, my mouth is now full of dead men's bones. And, and when they told me about that, and ever since, all I can think of is this verse uh, in Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus Christ uh, is upbraiding the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And he says, you're like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones. And I thought, well, how, how good an illustration is, you know, for me, uh, someone that's beautiful outward, but within is full of, <laughs> full of dead men's bones in my mouth now. So, um, so we're going to talk about that this morning and talk about what Jesus Christ has to say about dead men's bones and what it is he's illustrating with that uh, a sepul a whited sepulcher. And of course, a sepulcher is a burial uh, vessel, what we might today call a castle. Um, and, and we know even today. Uh, so he says you have a whited sepulcher. So it's painted white, it's beautiful on the outside, but within it's full of dead men's bones. Um, today we have a, a casket, you know, it's, it's metal or wood, polished wood, it's all very beautiful and satin inside and all that kind of stuff. But once you close the lid and put it in the ground, what's inside it? Dead men's bones. That's just the way it is. It's, it's, it's beautiful outwardly, but you really don't want to pop that thing open after a couple of years because it's not it's not a good sight. So so we want to talk about that. That's the illustration Christ is using of the scribes and the Pharisees uh, and their disobedience to the law. And so we're going to talk this morning about the law and about what the law was given to do and about the point that Jesus Christ is making with these scribes and these Pharisees as he, um, as he upbraids them for their unbelief. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Let's start there in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and uh, Deuteronomy 4 verse 1. Now, we know that God gave the law to Israel and, and one of the advantages of the law or the great advantage of the law is that once Israel had the law, they, they were aware aware then of God's wisdom. God gave them, in fact, Paul talks about it in Ephesians when he talks about the middle wall of partition being broken down. He talks about how it was, it was in, in, in abolishing the law and abolishing the commandments contained in ordinances. That's what enabled him to break down the middle wall of partition. It is that law and Israel having that law that made them uh, so much different than the rest of the nations. And, and Moses told them that in Deuteronomy chapter 4 as as he is rehearsing the law that God had given to that nation, if you go down to verse um, 5, he says this, Deuteronomy 4, 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall surely hear all these statutes and say, uh, which, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. 
people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments so righteous, as all this law, which I set before you this day? So, so one of the great advantages of the law, in fact, the great advantage of the law, is that it allowed Israel, what nation is there so great, verse 7, that hath God so nigh unto them? Verse 6, uh, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Verse 8, they have statutes and judgments uh, as righteous as this law. What nation is there that had the God of heaven and earth, the creator of heaven and earth, come to them and, and, and reveal to them and give to them his law, his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, his will? There was no nation like that. There never had been a nation like that. There never will be another nation like that that had God literally come to the earth and write his law with his own finger in tables of stone and give that to that nation. So it is a great, it is a great blessing and a great advantage for Israel to have that law. It is a great blessing and a great advantage for them to know God's will. If you turn to, to Romans chapter 2, uh, in Romans 2, Paul uh, Paul gives his take on that, and of course, it's uh, I say his take, but it's it's the Holy Spirit inspiring him to write. So certainly, it's it's more than just Paul's opinion, but but he is, is explaining the advantage that Israel had. In, in Romans, of course, he he talks about the depravity of man. He talks about how the Gentiles uh, uh, turned away from God, and God gave them up, gave them up, gave them over, and then he turns his attention to Israel. What about Israel? And, and in Romans two seventeen, he says this: Behold. Thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. The law was the thing in which they rested, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. So they knew his will. They were instructed out of the law, uh, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light uh, unto, unto those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. So the law allowed them to know God's will. It allowed them to be an instructor of the blind. It allowed them to be an instructor of the foolish. It allowed them to know what God desired. It allowed them to have the form of knowledge and truth. So that's, that's all good stuff. I mean, who, who wants to not have the form of knowledge and truth? Who wants to not know God's will? Who wants to not be able to be an instructor of the blind and a teacher of the foolish? Who, who would want to not be those things? Well, obviously, all those things are good. And the nation Israel, in having God's law, had all of those things. But now turn back, I should have had you hold your place there, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, because that is the great blessing of having the law. As described in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and as Paul describes in, in uh, Romans chapter 2. Yet with that great blessing, there came a great curse. And the curse in Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, is this, in verse number 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to what? Do. do. And what's the next word after do? All. All. You know, I know a preacher out in the Midwest, and he always said, you know, your, your King James Bible, every word in your King James Bible is important. And the most important words are the smallest words. <laughs> those two letter, three letter words, those are the ones that will trip you up. So you, you, you need to observe to do the law, but not just do the law, but do all the commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So the curse of the law is that now that you've got the instructions, you've got to do them. So it's like when you go to Lowe's and you see that nice barbecue grill sitting there, you know, that nice gas grill. You think, wow, that looked great sitting on our back deck. I'm, I'm going to get that grill. You say, you tell the guy, I want to buy that grill. And he brings you out, does he bring you out a grill? Yeah. No. What's he bring you out? A box. a box. And you're thinking, how can that grill fit in that box? Hmm, I don't know. Well, we'll see. So you take the box home, and you open the box, and what's in the box? A grill? Parties. No, pieces of the grill. Pieces of, a, pieces of a grill that hopefully will fit together. 
And so you take all the pieces out, and there on the bottom somewhere is this nice little instruction manual, you know, written by some Chinese guy, you know, and, and you know, eight different languages, so you gotta struggle to find the English version. And then, you know, it's written by somebody that really doesn't speak English, so, but you start through. So, is it good that you have instructions to put that thing together? Yeah, yeah because without the instructions, guess what? You, you, you are clueless. Uh, we, we, we got Jared a little, one of those little toy kitchen setups, you know, um, for Christmas. And it was, you know, you look at it online, oh wow, that nice little kitchen thing, set it in the corner there, it's got a little stove, and it's got a refrigerator, and da da da. It comes, it's in a box about this high, about this long, and I said, that's not that kitchen we saw online. At least, well, I don't know. That's what I ordered. I said, okay, so you, you open it up and you start laying these parts all out in the floor, and what do you know? We ended up with a kitchen. Eventually, ended up with a kitchen. But you got to follow those instructions, and you know you got to follow them every instruction in the right order. Because you look at it and you think, oh, I see, that goes in there. And you put that in there, and then you get three steps down and you find out, oh, I had to put tab A into slot G, and now I covered up slot G when I did it this way, so now I gotta undo all that. And you know, so, so you've got to, having the instructions is only half the battle, right? You've got to do the instructions to, to get the kitchen or to get the grill or to get whatever it is you're, you bought you can't, it's, it's not enough to say, I have the instructions. And Natalie says, all right, well then throw the hamburgers on the grill. Well, we don't have a grill, but I have the instructions. Well, then you better use the instructions to get a grill. So, so it's the doing of the thing. And that becomes the curse, doesn't it? Because what if I can't, what if those instructions are so Chinese that I can't figure it out? Well, then we're not going to have a grill. So God gave Israel this law, God gave Israel these commandments, God gave Israel these ordinances, God gave Israel His will, but, which is a great blessing because if I didn't have the instruction manual, I would have no hope. The Gentiles were without hope and without God. They, they had no hope. Israel at least, they had hope because they had an instruction manual. But that instruction manual is only as good as how much you implement that instruction manual. And so now it falls to that nation to, in, to, to heed those instructions, to do those instructions, and to build their righteousness. We're not building a grill or a kitchen, we're building righteousness. And you have to observe to do all these commandments in order to build your righteousness. Um, go back to, to, to uh, Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, of course, this is when God begins to give that law to Israel. And, and in Exodus 19, we all know this verse and, or this passage, and it's, it's important because it, it kind of sets the tone for the whole of the law. Exodus 19 verse 5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you should be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. <clears throat> These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people <coughs> unto the Lord. All that the Lord has spoken we will do. It's in the doing of it. Uh, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. And their part in keeping the covenant was, you got to do these things that the law prescribes. you got to follow the instructions to the letter, one at a time, right down the list, or you're not going to build your righteousness. Go to Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. And in Jeremiah 11, um, he refers back to that passage we just read in the book of Exodus. Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 1 Jeremiah 11, 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. 
Cursed be the man that obeyeth not. So it's more than just having the words. It's obeying the words. Verse 4, what covenant? Well, verse 4, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I commanded you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. He points back to that delivery out of Egypt and that covenant that God made with Israel when he delivered them out of Egypt. And he said, Cursed is the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. This agreement, this, this law that I gave to Israel, if you don't obey, you're cursed. So for Israel, it's a, it's a two-edged sword, that law. Because it's just like the instructions. You've, you've got the instructions to put the grill together. But if you can't perform the instructions, you're still not going to have a grill. And Israel had the instructions of how to be righteous before God. But if they can't perform those instructions. If they can't perform that law, then they will not be righteous before God. And to add to this problem, go with me to the book of Matthew, to add to this curse, if you will, to make the curse even more cursed and more difficult, Jesus Christ shows up on the scene, of course, we understand, in the course of time, as Israel, year after year, uh, breaks God's law and doesn't do the things which he said do and, and, and does do the things which he says don't do and, and Jesus Christ comes on the scene and he says this about the law in Matthew five seventeen. think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets I am not come to destroy but to fulfill for verily I say to you that heaven and earth till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what, you, what, what he's saying is, you have to do the law, and you have to teach them. That's what Paul said. You are confident that you're an instructor of, uh, of the blind, uh, a, a teacher of the foolish, being instructed out of the So you're going to teach and instruct the blind and the foolish, all the while doing the things that God said to do. And in, in doing that, your righteousness will exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now what in the world does that mean? Well, keep your hand right here in Matthew and go to Philippians chapter 3. Paul actually defines for us exactly what the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was. Because he was one of them. He was a Pharisee. And a Pharisee is simply a, a, a lawyer. You know, we have lawyers today, attorneys, and they are lawyers at law, uh, either the United States of America or the state of Pennsylvania or municipal law. They are lawyers that law that, that practice the laws of our civil government at some level. A Pharisee is a lawyer that practices the law of Moses. So he knows the law of Moses, so he knows all the technicalities, and he knows all the loopholes, and he knows the, the, the ways they can get out, and all that kind of stuff. Do you know where the term loophole came from? I never knew this. This has nothing to do with the law, but we learned it yesterday. It's another piece of useless information that my kids will say. That's nice you know that, Dad, but who cares? Um, loophole. We were at Fort Roberto yesterday, and you know they go in the fort and they have these holes where they'd stick their guns out and shoot. Those holes were called loopholes because it was a way for you to shoot without getting in trouble, without getting shot yourself. So it came to mean a way that you can get around something <laughs> without getting in trouble yourself. So that's what a loophole is. So now you know something you didn't know before. How many people knew that? There you go. See? I, yo. I thought Herb would be the one to know it, because he is a vast reserve of useless information, Herb is. But even though Herb didn't know it, his son knew it, so that's, at least it was in the family. I was, I was on the right course there, so, um, so that's, what, that's what a loophole is. So, anyhow, so, so lawyers are good at loopholes, right? They're good at, they're good at taking someone that may be guilty, but 
I can make him blameless according to the law. Right? So listen to what Paul says. Verse 4. Uh, what a Pharisee is. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof I might he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. So, as touching the law, I'm a lawyer. Touching the law of Moses, I'm a lawyer of that law. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which, righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Then, of course, he goes on to say what things were gained for me, those accounted lost for Christ. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But as touching the righteousness of the law, blame you couldn't hang anything on me. All right, Because I was a lawyer and I knew exactly how to walk the line of the law to, to maintain the righteousness of the law. No matter what I really was in my heart, I could maintain the righteousness of the law. And Christ, in his earthly ministry, he, he understood that's what the Pharisees are doing. They're, they're walking that line to main, be blameless according to the law, but not so much in their heart. So go back to Matthew 5 now. With that in mind, he says, I say unto you, verse 20, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you've got to be better than the scribes and Pharisees. You can't just be blameless according to the law as touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You have to be really blameless in your heart. He goes on to say, verse, um, verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of, uh, danger of judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So, if, if you... Uh, that Pharisee, as long as he had never actually killed somebody, he was, as touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He could, but he could hate his brother without a cause. He could be boiling in rage at his brother without a cause. And that's okay because I didn't actually kill him. If you go on down in the passage, of course, verse 27, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman that lusts after her in his heart hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So, so those Pharisees, they could, they could be lustful old leches as much as they wanted, but as long as they didn't actually commit adultery. You know, and then and, and you think they didn't like, you know, draw all those lines like you know, our former president. Well, it depends what is is. You know, you know how that goes. That's, he was he was a lawyer. Yeah, there's a loophole. He was a lawyer. That's what lawyers do. They they draw those lines and 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 try to keep on the right side of that line. So Jesus Christ is saying no, no more of that. No more of that. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Except you have righteousness not just in what you do, but except you have righteousness in who you are. That's the key, in who you are. In fact, David learned this. Go back to um, Psalm chapter 51. And it's interesting, the two, the two sins that he specifically talks about there in Matthew 5 are murder and adultery. And if you go back to Psalm chapter 51 and you read of King David, what are the two, I mean, you could, you could probably come up with other ones, but the two big primary sins that King David committed? Murder and adultery. D uh, David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then he had her husband killed. Put him in the heat of battle so that he would be killed, which is indirectly, of course, murder. So the two things that he talks about in Matthew 5 are the two things that David had done. David in Psalm chapter 51 says, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So David, he, he learns the, the lesson that Christ is trying to teach in Matthew 5. 
David learned in Psalm 51. Now, the vast majority of the nation never got it, never learned it. But here's the lesson. The lesson is that David learned, the reason I sin is because I'm a sinner. It is not sinning that makes me a sinner. It is being a sinner that makes me sin. I was shaped in iniquity, in sin did my mother conceive me. As a result, verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So what David figures out is, you know, I committed these sins regarding Bathsheba and Uriah. Not, that didn't make me a sinner. How long had David been a sinner? <laughs> Before birth even. In sin did my mother conceive me. And that's not talking about you know, the, the act of conception. That's talking about what he was at conception. Which to me, this is the argument that, that a quote-unquote fetus is a human being. Because if it wasn't a human being, could it be a sinner? No, no it couldn't. So if you say, in sin do my mother conceive me, when do you become a separate entity capable of being declared a sinner? At conception. That's, that's when it happens, which is maybe kind of an odd way to demonstrate when life starts. But clearly David felt his life started as a sinner at conception. And what God wants in me is in truth on the inward parts and in the hidden part. Not just in the flesh. And Jesus Christ takes those two sins of David in Matthew chapter 5 and he says, yeah, see, it's not about what you're doing out here. It's about your heart and your mind and what's on the inside. And so then go forward a little in Christ's ministry to Matthew 23 and that is the basis of what he's saying to the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 as he upbraids them and he says for example in, in verse 23 woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law judgment mercy and faith these ought to you have done and not to leave the other undone <coughs> Notice the things that he says, pay tithe of mint and anise and common. That's a, that's a very visible thing. That's something you've got to do. Pay your tithe. You've got to do that. Remember the Pharisee prayed, uh, I thank God that I'm not like this publican. I fast twice in each week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. So, so he, he's saying, look what I've done. Look what I, look, look at all the, I tithe. I fast twice in each week. I keep the Sabbath. I've never committed adultery. I've never killed anybody. I've, and, 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 and Jesus Christ says, you've done all those things, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy. You can't, judgment, mercy, and faith are internal. How do you make a judgment? How do you decide something? How do you determine how merciful you are? Where's your faith? Well, that's all internal stuff. Now, it may, it may affect what you do, but those things in themselves are internal things. And he goes on to say in verse 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within, they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is in the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within, you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity." Outwardly you appear righteous, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity, and that's not going to cut it, because I already told you, and I already told this nation, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, so the, the, the point that Christ's making is the law, in fact, go to Romans chapter 3, and, and, and in Romans 3, you know, and so many of these things about the law, you, you can see these, these indications. King David, for example. King David understood, okay, the law is teaching me that I'm a sinner. And the law is teaching me that I need to be clean on the inside. But now what's he going to do with that? <laughs> All he can do is say, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Does he know how God could do that? He has to trust that he will, but he's got no object to place his faith in other than the goodness and mercy of God. He doesn't have a sacrifice. In fact, he says in that same chapter, chapter 51, Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. (laughs) The sacrifices of God are broken in a contrite spirit. A broken, contrite heart thou wilt not despise. So I've done all I can do. I'm broken. I'm contrite. I'm begging for God's mercy. That's it. That's all I know to do. But then Paul comes along. And he's, he adds something. And listen to how beautifully he does it. Verse 19. I mean, he's, he's spent all of chapter 3 telling us how rotten we are. <laughs> kind of proving, what, kind of stating what the law proves. There is none righteous, no, not one, none that doeth good, none that followeth after God, all of those things. And then he gets to verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. So you know what the law did to David? It stopped his mouth. What what could David say? Is Psalm 51 written from David saying, Well, but 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 you don't understand. Well, but but you know, you don't get it. Oh, but but God, you don't know the situation I was in. Oh, but God, if you just knew the circumstances, what does David say? (laughs) I'm a sinner. It stopped his mouth. And he Declared in Psalm 51 before the Lord his guilt. Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And and, and I want to tell you, I think that, that means more than we usually think that it means. We usually take that to mean, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay. Because the law had said, thou shalt not steal. And if I take George's mug, I say, see you George, have a nice day. So, so the law says, thou shalt not steal. By the laws and all of sin, I had not known not to steal, except the law had said, thou shalt not steal. I didn't know it was wrong until the law said, thou shalt not steal. But it's more than that. What did the law teach David about his sin? It was offense against God. It was offense against God, not just George. I'm not offending George to take his mug. I might, but the real problem is I've offended God to take George's mug. But it's it's even beyond that. The law taught David, why did you steal the mug? Because you're a sinner. By the law is the knowledge of sin. But by telling me taking that mug is stealing, and then I go ahead and take it and steal it anyway, what's it say about me? You're a sinner. So by the law, the law is not just demonstrating, hey, when I take George's mug, that's stealing. The law is demonstrating the reason you take George's mug is because you were shapen in iniquity. And in sin did your mother conceive you. That's what the law is teaching you. The the knowledge of sin that the law gives is more than just the act of sin. The knowledge of sin that the law gives is the identification as a sinner that we are sinners by birth and we shall be sinners by birth until God does something about that and then and then here here's where so by the laws and knowledge of sin that's where David stopped David knew he was guilty his mouth was stopped and he realized he was a sinner and now he just has to say I hope God has mercy on me but Paul says this but now Not in David's day, but now. The righteousness of who? God. Whose righteousness would exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Probably. (laughs) He's probably a little bit more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ accomplished at Calvary, what he did on that cross, his faithfulness in going to that cross, trusting the Father's plan of redemption, the faith of Jesus Christ, and that righteousness which is available by the faith of Jesus Christ is offered unto all. Another little word that's important. All. Unto all. Anybody excluded from that? 
unto all. But it comes upon, his righteousness comes upon all them that, what? Believe. Believe. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what David learned. Remember what the law taught us. We're all sinners. But now, the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, without the law, is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, it's what he did. And it's, unto all, it's offered unto all, and it comes upon all them that believe. For all who sin and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word freely means the same thing as when he says you hate your brother without a cause. They hated Christ without a cause. <laughs> You're justified without a cause. There's nothing in you that would cause you to be justified. But there's everything in him that would want to justify you. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of it's back to that same person that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. God looks at the blood of Jesus Christ and says, I am propitiated, I am satisfied. And if you are satisfied with the blood of Christ, if you are satisfied that that blood uh, pays the penalty for your sin, then we're good because you agree with God. That's really what salvation is about, agreeing with what God says about Jesus Christ. That his death, his blood, is a propitiation, is a satisfaction for your sin death. The law gets you to the point where you say, yeah, I'm a sinner, okay, now what do I do about it? And grace takes you to the point where you say, here's what you do. What you do is believe that the redemption that is in Christ Jesus is all that you need. And that redemption in Christ Jesus doesn't get you the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It gets you the righteousness of God. That's good stuff. The righteousness of God. And, and, and that righteousness of God is as a free gift justified freely by His grace. It's not about what you do. It's not even anymore about what you think. You know that? It's not about what you think because God has given you His righteousness. And you're going to think unrighteous things and you're even going to do unrighteous things. And you know what? My righteousness isn't in me. It's in Him. And my position before God isn't in me. It's in Him. And my position in heavenly places isn't because of me. It's because of Him. And my justification isn't because of me. It's because of Him. And as long as He doesn't fail... I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. And God cannot fail, cannot lie, cannot bear false witness. We're good. So that verse that Jesus Christ gave, that the scribes and Pharisees are whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones, we, he's turned that on his head in the dispensation of grace. We have been purified, cleansed, made holy, made righteous, made just, justified, sanctified, um, washed from the inside. Now, he says, see if you can make what you got on the inside live out on the outside. That's exactly the opposite of what the law was. Fix up the outside and I'll teach you something about the inside. He says, now, I took care of the inside. You are justified, sanctified, washed, righteous in my sight. And now, let that righteousness, let that sanctification, let that justification live out in your members in this body of flesh. So that now we're not full, of, except for my mouth, we're not full of dead men's bones anymore. And we can let that live out through us. And let that righteousness, not our own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, live out through our members. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ, for the opportunity of looking to your word and studying together this morning. We thank you that we need not be like those Pharisees full of dead men's bones, but we can be, we, we can be in Christ justified, sanctified, uh, washed, and perfect without, without blame in your sight. And we pray that we would live our lives then as we are, the sons of God in Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.